Um, this is actually the first talk I've done where you're staring out into the ocean behind you. And so if you get a very acute case of stage fright, you could just jump out of the balcony, grab a boat, sail off into the Pacific, never be heard from again. That'd be sweet. Um, OK, so Stripe. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Stripe today, um, how we got started with it, how we grew it, and uh, what our philosophies were uh, as we developed it. Uh, and then you guys can uh, ask questions at the end. Um, Stripe is conceptually a pretty simple product. You make uh, an app, a service, uh, you let people pay for it, and then money accrues in your account. and uh, we pay you directly into your checking account. Uh, and so for the user, there, there really isn't that much to Stripe. Uh, but Stripe is also uh, a little more than that. You know, before Stripe, to do anything involving payments online, you had to go through this whole fragmented industry of merchant processors and banks and gateways who very much didn't get the web. And so Stripe is, Stripe is about the web. It's about a rejection of that. You know, literally, the companies before Stripe, they thought online payments meant having a, a PDF version of their application form. Um, you know, Stripe is about letting more businesses be started, letting businesses run more efficiently. It's about um, you know, new players versus in incumbents. It's about product being better, hopefully, uh, than the size of your headquarters. Uh, and so to us, Stripe has always been about th this kind of thing and more. Uh, this has been our worldview for a long time. But it wasn't always clear to us that that worldview was correct. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the very, very early days of Stripe when we started it, um, how we kind of got it into existence. Um, we started Stripe back in 2009. And at the time, Patrick, my co-founder, and I, we were in college. Uh, and we had, been, we had been building online products for a while. We had built a, an online software business. We had developed a, an iPhone app um, for the App Store. And even before, there was an App Store on, on jailbroken iPhones. Um, and, and sometimes, when you're, you're building things online, you really feel like you're living in the future. Uh, this iPhone app that we made, uh, it stored an offline, co an offline copy of Wikipedia so you could access it when you were traveling or when you were away from data. Uh, and we just found this awesome. Like, it's literally the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, you can access any article you know, on this device in your pocket no matter where you are. Uh, and this was only possible due to smartphones having gotten so good in the past few years. It really was a different world to, to five years prior. Uh, and then sometimes uh, when you'd actually be, uh, be building things online, it, it was the opposite. You'd feel like you're completely in the Stone Age. Uh, and so you know, we'd develop something, uh, we, we'd build a product, uh, we'd host it. And you know, this was in the, you know, just at the start of the golden age of Heroku and AWS and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then you go to actually charge money uh, for what you'd built. And you'd be confronted with something like this. Um, I, I, like, I'm not even sure where to start here. Um, one would hope you could start by, by signing up, uh, but there's nowhere really to be found uh, on the home page. It does tell you about accepting credit cards over the telephone. Um, and eventually, you poke around the site long enough, uh, and you find this form um, where you can fill out a bunch of details, uh, and a sales rep will get in touch with you. Um, and, and so we felt, you know, this pretty clearly uh, wasn't the future. Uh, and there's a few specific uh, you know, problems with this. One, it was companies that you know, truly didn't get the web. Uh, they didn't get APIs. It was all done through SOAP interfaces that were constantly breaking. Um, and uh, it, it was extremely fragmented. Uh, you, it wasn't just one service. You had to go through two or three services just to do a basic thing like earn money online. So we, we set about fixing it. Um, and we didn't know very much about online payments at the time. Uh, we didn't know very much about what that would entail. Um, but we knew the product that wanted to exist. Uh, and this was that. Uh, our, don't tell our designers at Stripe that I showed you this, because this is the very first 
um, iteration of the Stripe website before Stripe employed designers. Um, but th this actually captured a lot of you know, what we cared about. Uh, it was uh, simple, you know, the pricing was like front and center, there was a link to it on the homepage. Uh, the API documentation was front and center. You could uh, actually try it out without even giving us any information. If you hit that try it out button, you're presented with this screen, a new account. Uh, and again, it's pretty ugly and pretty basic, but it actually, you know, gets across the core of what we wanted to exist. We wanted to give people the power to make things online and start uh, earning money from what they'd made. And so there's you know, this checklist on the right. Um, you drop the code into your application, you give us a few details, and you're up and running and earning money. Uh, and you know, this was something that would be designed for the web rather than this whole banking industry who didn't really seem to get it. Uh, there was only one problem, which was we, we didn't actually know how to make a credit card processor. Um, you know, it was all very well and good to, uh, to spec this out, um, but that didn't really help you. Uh, and so, you know, this was late 2009, early 2010. We started down this road of how does one make a credit card processor. Uh, in the early days, we thought we would have to become a bank. Uh, and actually, the, uh, the OCC is the government entity, government entity that issues bank charters, uh, and the list of recently granted bank charters uh, is on their homepage. So naturally, we like, got the list of recent uh, bank charters and emailed the CEOs of those banks. Uh, and we're like, hello, I notice you have a bank charter. Uh, I'm a student working on a project. I'm also interested in getting a bank charter. Would you like to grab coffee? They invariably said no. Um, we, uh, we eventually found a company that was uh, willing to partner with us. Uh, they were based out of Long Island. Um, and uh, they were you know, a very small payments company. And this was not at all how you'd like to build this business. Because every time you know, someone signed up for a Stripe account, we had to go fill out a bunch of forms and fax them to set up an account with this other service to actually make it work. Uh, you know, it was much more expensive than we liked. We actually were, um, in some cases, subsidizing uh, our users. But, uh, but it got us you know, to those first few users. Uh, and we kept exploring the space and, and trying to figure it out. We read books after books on payments, uh, which is difficult. Um, you know, we talked to payments consultants that are like full-time people in this industry. Um, we, we ended up raising investment in the summer 2010 from, from Peter Thiel. Um, you can imagine that pitch. You, know, you go into the co-founder of PayPal, and you're like, so payments online, completely broken, am I right? Um, and uh, you know, we eventually got intros to the uh, the major U.S. banks, uh, and uh, that was you know starting that summer uh, through you know four months of negotiations, four months of talking to people, four months of you know learning the the magic words uh, that got you to a further meeting. Uh, we finally got our our first bank contract signed. Um, we we had no idea uh, what to do once we, you know, once we got the contract, um, uh, when we were at the, the due diligence stage, we were presented with this 100-page banking contract. And so we just called up every investor we had saying, do you know anything about contracts or the law um, or how these things work? Um, and, and then once we'd signed, we spent uh, five months integrating with, with that bank's systems. Uh, and so now we had something that was you know, somewhat scalable um, to, to get up and running with. Uh, and we would, we would launch three months after that uh, in, in late 2011. Um, but, but of course, that wasn't, you know, th that was one obstacle out of the way. Uh, Stripe existing as a payments company means, you know, these kind of things come up again and again. You know, how were we going to stay ahead of fraudulent users? How were we going to comply with regulations? How were we going to make this same model uh, work internationally? The arc of Stripe has been uh, making the product we wanted to exist happen in this like pretty complex real world. Um, so I want to walk you through a little bit our our philosophy for that. The the things we care about as uh, as we grow Stripe uh, because I think you know we're in phenomenal company here. Uh, you know in this room we have uh, people who are very very brilliant at building products. Uh, and so I want to talk about uh, you know, once you have a product that's awesome, growing it through these increasing orders of, magnitudes of, uh, orders of magnitude of users. Um, the, the first thing that is, is one of our mottos uh, is doing things that, that don't scale. 
Uh, and this might sound you know, odd at first because presumably you know, as a startup poised for growth, that's directly the opposite of sound advice. Um, but the key thing here is that, uh, like, to be clear, this is do awesome things that don't scale. Don't do silly things. Um, the, the, the things you can do, you have a natural advantage uh, when you're small, uh, and larger companies, competitors, other people just don't have that advantage. Uh, so to give you a concrete example, uh, the way Stri support worked for Stripe uh, in the early days through the first 100 users was you would add Patrick or myself on GTalk. Uh, and so you would be integrating Stripe, you'd be working with the API, you'd probably have questions come up every now and then, uh, you would ping us, uh, and we would like either, you know, if it was a problem on our side, we would fix it for you, uh, if it was a problem on your side, we'd, we'd walk you through it. Uh, you know, we knew we wouldn't be able to keep that up eventually, uh, and so we ended up making a campfire room where anyone could come in, uh, get help with their integrations, uh, and we rotated the support through all the developers working on Stripe. Uh, and again, this was a really, really good experience as a user. You were talking to the people who built the product. They knew the product in and out. You know, if you had, there was something up with your data, they could just jump into the database and look it up. This is a support experience that you know, any kind of larger company, PayPal, all the other payments companies that people complained about just could not do. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a huge advantage for us. Uh, and you, know, you, you don't need to worry that this is not something that uh, you'll be able to, to keep up long term because you can keep just tweaking how it works as you grow. It started off as adding us on IM. It became you know, in our shared campfire room where we all run a rotation. Eventually, we ended up uh, having dedicated uh, support people. But even to this day, we hire engineers for that. And so you can hop into a chat room with a Stripe engineer, and they will walk you through integrating Stripe. It ends up being a pretty cool experience. Um, you know, similarly, in our early days during the beta, uh, we were doing a huge amount of unscalable work for each and every account that got set up. You know, Stripe made setup really, really easy. You filled out a few forms, and then we went off and faxed a bunch of things. Um, I was in college for, for part of it, and I remember, uh, you know, being late going out to a party because, like, I was there filling out the, this paperwork uh, and then heading out for the evening. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, users loved it. Users viewed Stripe as this uh, product that worked completely, completely seamlessly. And it did on the back end eventually. But during this, this stage of getting set up, um, we made it work just by, by picking the, you know, the, the most proximate option. Um, and in uh, April 2011, uh, we decided to rewrite the Stripe API. Uh, it had been this you know, slightly, I don't know if any of you guys remember the old Stripe API, but it was a slightly messy not very restful uh, interface, uh, and we decided to uh, make a proper REST API. You know, again, it seems like kind of a problem given that everyone's using it. Uh, but because the, the number of users was still uh, somewhat capped and you could think about the entire set of users, uh, we looked at how everyone um, was using Stripe, wrote a translation layer, uh, and then manually moved every single user uh, over to the new API, working with them if necessary, uh, and like measuring if people were using old API calls, things like this, uh, and eventually managed to get them all moved over to the new one and turn off the old one. Again, this is not something that a larger company can do. It's not some, something you can do if you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on your API, but you can take advantage of it while you're small. The, the second thing that's uh, really important to us is that you know, collaboration and uh, how a team works together and that culture, it takes active steering. Uh, and it's very important that, 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 that you think about what's important to, to a team uh, rather than that purely emerging organically. Uh, and this will be a little bit different for, for every team that works together. Uh, at Stripe, one of the things we, we care most about is um, you know, transparency in how the whole company works and what people are working on, uh, and then uh, a lot of autonomy uh, in people working individually. And, and those two kinds of things go, go hand in hand. You don't need a lot of top-down management if everyone else can see what other people are working on, uh, but you know, it's, each is a requirement for the other. Uh, and so we've done things like, there's actually quite little person-to-person -person, uh, email at Stripe. Nearly everything takes place over, over mailing lists. Uh, and we have fairly granular mailing list control set up. So you can subscribe to the various parts of the company that you care about. Uh, that means that not only do people know what's going on um, in other parts of the company, they can pick up on and be educated through other conversations that are just happening naturally. Uh, it makes it easier for people to jump around different parts of the company rather than being stuck working on and maintaining one part of the code. 
Um, in that same vein, when somebody new starts at Stripe, um, rather than just going and directly working with their team uh, that they're going to be working at, um, they, they, they do a tour of the whole company. If you think about the different teams we have, you know, you have uh, the people working on the front end product, people working on the API, systems infrastructure, risk and fraud systems, financial operations, all these things. Someone will spend a day with each and every one of these teams uh, to get to know how that part of the product works, uh, to get to know the people working on it. Uh, and then they end up um, with the team they're actually going to be working on long term. Uh, and, you know, is this a little bit inefficient? Sure. But it also uh, makes the company much closer as a unit. It means that people understand how different parts of the product work. Uh, and it lets people, it gives people much more freedom in like the parts of the code base they're able to jump in. Um, and, and even, you know, w with the transparency, taking it as far as things like um, at our, we hold all hands meetings every few weeks. Uh, at those meetings, you know, yeah, you want to talk about good things and you want to celebrate releases and you want to see what each of the, the teams are working on. Um, but, but it's also pretty important to be transparent uh, about the bad things. Uh, and so one thing we un instituted was the FUD section, uh, which stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, and so at the end of the meeting, uh, everyone just goes through the vague worries and concerns that are on their mind. You know, maybe we feel that we're like adding so much code to the code base too quickly that we're building up a whole pile of technical debt. You know, vague concerns along these lines that are hard to action, but very important to be out there. Uh, and we figure that, you know, it's hard to actually solve a problem until you're talking about it. Um, and so we want to encourage people to, in a sense, be, be negative. Um, and again, you know, I'm not saying that uh, any of this is objectively good. I'm just saying that uh, how you work together, uh, or I'm not saying this is you know, objectively the right thing for everyone. I'm saying that how you work together takes a lot of active work. We spend a lot of time you know, getting conventions around email in place, uh, designing a way for, for people who start at Stripe uh, to explore the company, um, designing a good all hands format, where, which is actually useful uh, for sharing information. And, and I think people tend to think that you know, transparency and collaboration, um, you know, these things evolve naturally, and they do to some extent, but they also, they also take design uh, like everything else. Um, the third thing that we're, we're very big on is uh, keeping talking to users. And you know, you, everyone probably does this in the early days. Uh, you know, with your, uh, you know, in any kind of product uh, iteration cycle, uh, your first 10 users, you're probably pretty close to. And, and we certainly were. Uh, with the early Stripe users, we would actually you know, sit down and integrate the Stripe API for them. Uh, and this would, this would have two benefits. You know, one, it would help us actually sell the product in the early days where it was, it was fairly unproven um, uh, in, the, you know, in the days when no one else was using it. Uh, but the other was we got to see what it actually looked like and felt like uh, in the real world. We got to see what the you know, annoyances were that would end up with you like pushing off integrating until a later date. We got to see you know, what worked well and what didn't. Um, and so in the early days of the product, you know, it's really important to talk to users. That's, that's a reasonably well-known fact. But, but the, thing you, the thing not to forget is that you have to keep doing this on an ongoing basis because your users change, the, uh, the landscape around you ch uh, changes, and you're always changing the product. Uh, and, and so it would be very dangerous to, uh, you know, to, to step back and create a wall between you and those users. We just launched yesterday um, a new feature on Stripe where you can, uh, with the money coming into your Stripe account, rather than just dumping it into your checking account, uh, you can send it off to anyone else's bank account directly. And so you know, for people building on marketplaces, you know, ride sharing services, cleaning services, uh, these kinds of things, uh, this is huge because they can pay their contractors, their vendors, uh, directly from their Stripe account. But this is something that was not really on our radar until you know, we started talking to our fastest growing users who all happen to be marketplaces. Uh, and they had a great life when it came to actually earning money. Uh, but then when it came to, to paying the people, paying the sellers in the marketplace, uh, it was like the old world all over again. They were logging into their bank portal to send payments uh, or something like this. And so, so this emerged purely from uh, talking to these users. Uh, and in a, in a similar vein, um, it, it, it's pretty important as you become you know, more knowledgeable about your own product uh, and more knowledgeable about the ecosystem, not to, not to become an insider, not to become too familiar. 
um, you know, part of uh, what made Stripe different and stand out in the early days is we were unreasonable and we didn't know anything about payments. We knew how to make developer tools and that's the angle we were coming from. Uh, you know, we didn't really know that uh, creating instant account setup was like a hard thing that people usually didn't do. We just knew this was like obviously how it should work. Uh, ben Silberman from Pinterest uh, actually has this really interesting thing where he deletes his Pinterest account fully, all the data, and recreates it on a reasonably regular basis. Uh, because for him, the most important uh, thing in Pinterest is new users uh, and their experience. And so he doesn't want to become too caught up. You know, he might have an awesome experience because he has 4,000 friends and all this stuff pinned, but most users won't have that experience. And so you know, sometimes when he deletes his account, he'll decide he's going to be a mobile-only user and only ever use the app and make sure that you know, he's not missing out on anything major that like all the Pinterest devs and product managers wouldn't notice uh, because they're all intimately familiar with the product already. Uh, and you know, if you're working on a product, it's nearly always your, your life and soul and you, you know it intimately. Uh, and so it's very easy to become an insider, but that is not, um, that is not your users. Uh, and, I, and I think it's pretty easy to forget that. Um, so these are the things that you know, we've held pretty closely uh, as we grow, uh, but it's still very early days for Stripe, and we're not even close to being done um, with what we're setting out to accomplish. You know, we're, we're not just building a payments API for developers. We're trying to build this payment layer for the internet. We're trying to uh, enable new kinds of commerce that didn't exist yet, let more businesses be started, um, have more transactions take place, uh, have more people start participating in the web economy, from all around the world. Uh, and this is something we feel should have happened a long time ago, uh, but it wasn't the case. And you know, I think these problems are, are all around us. Uh, you know, we're all here at ValueCon because uh, we like designing things uh, and we like building things. Uh, and I think there's, there's no shortage uh, of these problems to work on. Uh, the, it's, I think, obvious to all of us that the uh, the world is is pretty inefficient, uh, and we are we are people who have the power to change that. Uh, and we didn't at Stripe get terribly caught up in the fact that we knew nothing about the industry uh, that we were entering because uh, we knew the product that that we wanted to exist. Um, and so, you know, that's a little bit about the Stripe story. That's a little bit about the uh, the problem we're tackling. Um, I'd love to take some questions from you guys. Uh, and see where we go from there. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has questions, I'll bring the microphone around. So taking payments online sounds like this impossibly huge, like unaccomplishable task. How did you stay motivated like through the years of doing it? So the big thing the big thing for us was we, we kind of removed the opportunity to give up because Stripe was in private beta for a very long time. We started, you know, the first commit in the Git repo was in October 2009, and we launched publicly in September 2011, almost two years later. Um, but almost from the very beginning, uh, like I said, we had beta users. We had people using it. You know, we had gotten a way to make it work, and then we were constantly refining that. And so once you have users, you know, depending and relying on your product, uh, that's a pretty big motivational factor. We were able to watch the growth curve and like more and more people coming online, and that's pretty motivating. And so I am all for having long private betas, all for not launching stuff, but I am a huge believer in having users from the very beginning and having that, you know, having growth to drive you and to work with. So the last company I worked for, we were um, looking into changing our, our uh, payment gateway. And, and, um, and uh, the developer was just really impressed with uh, Stripe because it had sample code on the home page. And even in seeing the old um, design, there's, there's you know, integration API code on the mm -hmm. home page itself. Was this something, and I was just curious when I saw that, um, is this something that uh, you intentionally 
Is it, did this grow, grow out of the fact that you guys were developers or was it like, uh, you, you know, you were, you were tempted to write a bunch of marketing copy, copy and aim it towards a, a wider audience, but then specifically tried to narrow down your, your, your uh, target market by, um, by was, it, was it something that just happened or did you intentionally take that strategy? It, it, was, it was always pretty intentional. You know, we viewed uh, this as, uh, you know, one, the most important thing, like, you know, the, the way you primarily interacted with this, uh, and two, kind of a shibboleth where, you know, we, we, were, we were showing that we understood the people that we were, we were trying to sell to. You know, if you looked at anything uh, that existed up to then, it was all stock photos and, you know, financial speak and everything like this. Uh, and that's not really what Payments Online are about, uh, is about. Uh, payments Online is about, you know, that piece of infrastructure that, like, inter like weaves into the whole product you're building. Uh, and you know, when you integrate Stripe, you're integrating it in, into multiple points of the app, and then you're doing reporting, and you're doing analytics, and everything like that. So this is really a technology thing, and we wanted to represent it as such. And so for us, you know, putting code in the home page was just like Heroku puts code in the home page. You know, it, it made sense. Uh, similar to what Drew was talking about earlier, um, d did you guys ship your beta kind of relatively incomplete? Like maybe you potentially didn't have a lot of the feature set there, and did you, uh, were there any kind of features or, or pieces of the roadmap that you scrapped because you learned that maybe you kind of validated it without even having to build it? Right. Yeah. Um, so we shipped the beta that did one thing I think pretty well, you know, that case of charging for a single thing online. And then we've continued to, to like build it out as we go. And so you know, the beta shipped without uh, recurring subscriptions. Uh, and we found pretty early on that that's what everyone was doing. And there's a pain in the ass to write the, this code themselves. And so we added that and took that off their plate for them. You know, like I said, just recently, um, we found that everyone was taking the money they earned and not just st stashing in their bank account, but paying it out to other people. And so we said, oh, that should just be a native part of Stripe. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I, I think you want to hold yourself to high quality standards for a beta. Like, whatever use case it serves, it should serve pretty well. But you'll find that it doesn't serve like many pretty common use cases. And you'll start to wrap those in as, uh, as the beta goes on and you get more users. Uh, but those needs generally you know, make themselves pretty apparent. Like, you know, at least with our users, they were. They were vocal about it. Cool. Uh, and can you share a little bit about the the health of the of the company today, the the growth? I mean, how you guys? Yeah, I mean, so well? Stripe, I guess, is now twenty months since since launch, which we view as kind of the epoch. Um, and I mean, the users are doing awesome things with it. They process millions of dollars each day on Stripe. Uh, we're in four countries right now, and we'd like to be in a lot more. So one of the big things for us, we just set up an office in London, uh, and we'll be opening in more countries. Uh, soon after that. And so for us, it's about like what are the interesting things that people are building online, and can we support that, uh, and expanding to, to make that better. Cool. With you guys and uh, folks like the people at Simple, um, really just reimagining the financial space and the consumer financial space, I just want to say thank you. It's awesome. It's, it's about time, and I appreciate all the, the hard work and the thinking you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my question as sort of a follow-up to the last question. Um, why did it take so long for someone to tackle this problem? Mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I'm, dealing, I'm still dealing with PayPal problems every single day because I'm based in Australia and you guys are not there yet. Um, it seems like such an obvious problem and everyone's complaining about it. I mean, there are now fan sites about pay people that hate PayPal. Why does it take, why did it take so long? Like, what was the biggest problem to actually get something like this started? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, um, th that's the key question. And I think it's not just payments. Uh, there are so many, like I, uh, you know, when I was making this slide, I just threw a collection of things together that like struck me as random problems. Um, and you know the, the, the many of these are still open questions that you'd think someone would have solved by now. Um, with payments, uh, I think it's pretty easy to write off, like I said, areas that you think you don't know about the important parts. And I think the realization for us was that 
the important part of online payments is like it's a developer tool. It's a developer tool like any other tools, uh, and you have to you know you have to be able to do certain things to to make it work. You have to do financial engineering to make something like Stripe work, just like you have to be able to like manage racks of servers to like build a hosting company. But in both cases, like this product is actually a developer tool problem and not you know and a web problem, not a finance problem. And so I think we just like refused to acknowledge that we weren't qualified to work on it. Um, and went from there. Uh, but I think a lot of the people we talked to were like, oh, but you know nothing about payments. Um, and, and that mindset had prevailed. And so I think, again, that's, that's pretty common in other areas where uh, there's kind of a, a, a leeriness or there's a, a hesitancy to, to jump into them because they, they seem hard from the outside. But, but you know, if a problem like this is truly a product problem, then, I mean, why not go for it? I have a question before we go back here. Um, so a lot of people here who build stuff will run into an issue of they build something and then somebody else comes out with something super similar or almost identical. Yep. And that's happened to you guys. And uh, I was just wondering if you had any advice for everyone here on how to deal with that, like personally and as like a business. Um, I think there's relatively few examples throughout history of people being crushed by competitors. I think there's often, you know, in the cases where companies uh, fail, it's, it's due to other factors, uh, not just competitors emerging. Uh, and so we tend to, you know, we notice what competitors are doing, but we don't pay that much attention to it. You know, you want to have your thesis around what should exist, how this product should work, um, uh, and, uh, and execute on that. Uh, and one particular example of uh, competitors is clones where they're kind of lagging you and they're they're following what you're doing um, and and that's not so bad right because they're following the most recent thing you know you've launched they're skating to like where the puck is right now rather than where it's going to be uh, and so uh, you don't need to or you need to worry less about uh, clones than independent thinking competitors uh, because you're, you're just naturally a certain amount ahead of them When are you going to buy Spacebox? <laughs> um, I did not ask him to ask that question. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, there's like a ton of cool stuff that uh, is built on Stripe. And I mean, the whole point is actually that, you know, Stripe does not have to buy Spacebox, does not have to buy Wufu, does not have to buy, you know, all, all the awesome things that people people build on it, uh, and you know, if we were to do that, that would get very expensive very fast. Because like Shopify, uh, we have this like awesome partnership with, and Squarespace, and they're companies that are doing pretty well. Um, uh, and, and, and like the, the point of Stripe again is that as this technology, you can hook it into like all these different components. You can hook it into Spacebox, you can hook it into a shopping cart, uh, and it's not the case that you know Stripe should have to like own all parts of all commerce on the internet. It should be the platform that lets you like freely do anything with this. Uh, but like we are we are very very happy in a world where like you plug Stripe into your SpaceX Sp Spacebox account and that works awesomely. Hey John. I'm back here, Yo. some weird guy in the back. Um, first off, congrats on building one of the most simply beautiful products on the web uh, and demand. Um, I have two questions, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. I don't want to abuse it. But um, the first one is, uh, what's one of the biggest mistakes, if you can talk about it, that you've made and what you learned from it so far? Hmm. I'm trying to think about a mistake I want to talk about. Yeah, that's tough. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's pretty easy after you launch to, uh, you know, to get sidetracked on, or uh, when you, before you launch a product, the normal uh, mode of operating is you're thinking about, you know, what is the product you want to exist, um, like how you're going to get there, where it's going to develop, uh, and you have this whole roadmap and this whole kind of uh, pieces about where things are going. And then you launch a product. And, and you're in this completely different world. You're dealing with users. You're dealing with competitors. You have to be reactive. You know, there's all these people who want to, you to like change things about the product. There's all these people who have opinions. And you go from this mode of like creating in the abstract by yourself to, to existing as a real world company and maintaining a thing. Uh, and when you think about it, the thing that made your product successful in the first place was the fact that you had an opinion. You had this like way you viewed the world should work. 
Uh, and it's very easy to lose that and become reactive and uh, you know, just, just start operating and maintaining. Uh, and so I think you know, um, for us, like, what we're always trying to do is make sure we're like, looking at the world ahead and looking at what we want to, what we want to make and what we want to exist. Uh, and so you know, it probably took us a little longer than we should to make something like um, the, uh, the payouts API, where uh, you know, this was clearly the way the world was going. Um, and it took until like, you know, our users were asking us for it until we made it, whereas we could have probably predicted that in advance if we'd actually looked at where the world was going and what products should exist. Um, you know, I, I don't think that was a catastrophic mistake uh, for Stripe, but I, I think, in general, you know, it, it's better to be forward-looking than reactive. Okay, my second question is, we have a lot of product builders in this room, mm -hmm. and you built a product, but there's always a business that goes around it that you don't necessarily know, especially if it's your first product. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned about business after the product, and what would be some advice or maybe a, a resource or somehow of learning business or kind of foreseeing the business of your product if you haven't been there yet? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I found with my certainly with myself, and I think a lot of product people they view to to view they tend to view themselves like unqualified. Uh, uh, for the, the business components, or they, they try to shy away from that. Uh, and I think that's not actually, um, that's actually a little bit of a dangerous tendency, uh, in that my advice would be to uh, just like learn the business side of things as you go. One of, the, one of the core things you really need to be able to do if you're building a product that has you know, users like Stripe that are companies, um, or you know wh where they're where they're making some decision is you really need to be able to to sell the product. You know we have companies now that do tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars through Stripe, uh, and so it's a it's a it's a pretty big com commitment for them to use Stripe, uh, and it's very important that you be able to like communicate well. You know how this works, how you'll solve your problem, uh, why this is a good investment, uh, and no one really but the um, people or like. No one will ever be as good at that as the like people who know the product intimately and the people who actually worked on making it happen. Uh, and so you need to learn to to be able to sell it, to do business things like that. Uh, on the actual you know administration side of running a business, uh, I don't think that's that's too hard until you're at scale. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, you certainly don't want to view the the business side of things as like a, a different thing to be handed off to someone else. Uh, it is pretty part and parcel of the product. Anybody else have a question? All right, thanks, John. Sweet.